Uh, I'm Roger Dodds. I'm Roger Dodds. I'm at Fort at uh, St. Luke's in Fort Collins. I'm a retired college teacher in the humanities, and I got involved in response to uh, Bishop Kim's experience on March 22nd at East High. We're going to play a clip of that, but I'd like to just let you know that our agenda for the uh, day is to spend 30 minutes uh, describing the experience of uh, three or four different parishes uh, and the ideas we've sorted out. And at the end of 30 minutes, break into small group discussions, uh, the idea of which is to um, share your impressions uh, and sift out the best ideas that come from you, the people. The last 15 minutes, we'll come back into the general session and we'll need a recorder in each session to we'll read back the best idea or to read back their uh, uh, summary of what we did. And uh, we'll have 15 minutes to talk about where we go from here. Janet, tell us when you'd like to begin. I yeah. see the bishop is here. I was waiting for Gary. Is okay. Yeah, well, uh, hi, I'm uh, Deacon Gary Darris. I'm assigned to St. Michael's in Colorado Springs. And we'll um, open this session with a prayer. It's the prayer attributed to St. Francis. Let's bow our heads. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there's hatred, let us sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there's discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there's sadness, joy. Grant, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. 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 We're going to um, begin this next section playing about a minute and 32 second clip of Bishop Pym's interview or uh, diocesan um, video about her unfortunate experience when she uh, went to East Junior or East High School in Denver earlier in the year, and she was caught in the middle of an active uh, shooter on campus. And Janet, would you be able to play that now? Thank you. Cole, he... My apologies. I need to go back to the beginning of that. That's okay. Things don't always go as you hope. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. Janet, I have it queued up if you'd like me to do it with share screen. Greetings, beloved in Christ. This morning, as I was on my way to the office, I received a text from my kid at Denver East High School saying that he had left some things he needed for class and asking if I would be willing to bring them to him. I agreed. As I showed up, at East High School and was walking in the doors. Yeah, I we're heard just emergency mail. vehicles. Silent police cars headed toward the school. I walked in the doors and was immediately grabbed by a staff person who said to me, ma'am, please come with me. We are in lockdown right now. I need to get you someplace safe. She took me into an office and squirreled me in, turned the lights out, told everyone in that office to get down. The police came in, into the school, 
armed and swarmed through the first floor. I texted my child immediately asking where he was and if he was okay. He said he was in assembly. He'd been told that they were in lockdown and that he was okay. After a while, news began to trickle out and he texted me, mom, sorry, I invited you to, a school, to our school during an active shooter situation. As I sat in that room with students and faculty, some terrified and crying, some just numb, I found that I was furious. Hmm. I was furious that our kids, our teachers have okay. to be subjected to this terror. I am furious. There seems to be no will to ensure that a kid with an issue and a gun can't terrorize students and teachers in any of our schools, in any of our states, all around this country. I am furious that our leaders are so cold hearted that they have no regard for what I experience today. I ask your prayers. I ask your prayers for the victims of the shooting who were trying to disarm this kid. I ask your prayers for the students and teachers of East High School. Mm -hmm. I ask your prayers for our nation. And I decided that I will do whatever I can, whenever I can, wherever I can, to make sure that this terror and violence comes to an end. And I recognize that I cannot fight evil with evil, and I am praying for the discernment of the Spirit to lead me in this. And I ask your prayers for an end to this senseless, awful violence. Thank you, Jana, for playing that. Well, we were not able to see Bishop Kim give that very passionate, emotional speech about her unfortunate experience that she had to uh, live through while she was at her son's school and what her son had to experience as well as many other students and the uh, victims who were injured during that incident. Um, so uh, in this situation, if you do not know someone personally involved in a, a mass shooting situation or a shooting situation, you know that our very own bishop in our diocese was involved and her son was involved. So that's two people in our family that we personally know who was involved in a very dangerous situation with a person who had a gun. As I said in the beginning, my name is Gary Darris. I am the deacon at St. Michael's Episcopal Church in Colorado Springs. I, Before I was a deacon, I was a police officer with the city of Colorado Springs for 34 years. During that 34 years, I was personally involved in many um, mundane, routine law enforcement situations. I was also involved in the uh, Planned Parenthood um, shooting that occurred in Black Friday, October 2015. And a month earlier, I was personally shot at by an individual who took three lives prior to myself and other officers confronting him downtown in Colorado Springs at the intersection of Platt Avenue and Wasatch. Um, I, I personally come to this uh, issue about gun violence or mass shootings, not only because of my background as a police officer for 34 years, but as a, a Christian um, and now as a deacon. I. I, and these are I statements, um, I would say that um, as a Christian, I, I think 
that I need to be personally involved and our church needs to be personally involved in a situation where we can help prevent or at least reduce the number of these mass shootings that we experience in our country each and every month, each and every year. Now, um, in no way am I advocating that guns be eliminated from anybody's personal property. That's not what I'm, I'm here for. I'm here to bring a coalition of people together in the Episcopal Church to talk about this situation, and again, that we're all affected by um, each and every day, each and every month. And that's what I did uh, earlier this year. I think um, the group we've uh, called ourselves Gun Violence Awareness Group, but the title doesn't really have anything of great importance. Um, we're just a group of individuals across the diocese that have come together that feel the same way that we feel that we're being called to come and and uh, come up with solutions, I guess, that are respective to um, both sides of this topic. Um, and that's what we've been doing since May, as I said. And we've also come up with a, some objectives. Or Jana, are you able to pull up the objectives? Janet, I have those. Okay. He's got them up now, Roger. Thank you. You can go to the next slide, Janet. I'll, I'll begin reading this uh, objectives, see if we can uh, go through these slides. The first objective is to respond to Bishop Kim's call to do something about this senseless, awful violence in our liturgy, in our community awareness actions, and in our legislative advocacy. This wording um, not only came from uh, Bishop Kim, but also came from uh, Bishops United Against Gun Violence. And if you're not aware of that, that's a, uh, a group of bishops throughout the United States that came together for this very same reason that we're coming together to have a, a talk about how we can help reduce these shootings in our country. The second objective is to respond, to coordinate the efforts underway in our member parishes and sharing and resources and evaluating together the effectiveness of our efforts. And we've done that again over the past couple of months. Different parishes throughout their uh, diocese have come together from the front range to the western slope, from southern Colorado to northern Colorado. Then the third objective is to invite other parishes to join us walking together in fulfillment of our baptismal covenant to strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being. Thank you, Janet, for showing those. You can leave those up there for a couple more minutes if you want. I, I think it really comes down to that third point for me, to strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being. We all periodically throughout the uh, our church year uh, celebrate baptisms as a community. And when we do that as a community, we uh, recite the baptismal covenant. And this is what we recite each and every time. And as Christians, as a, as a people who were uh, created and loved by a loving and merciful God, we are asked not only by God, but our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to uh, love our neighbor as ourselves, which is part of his great commandment. And I personally don't think that we're loving our neighbor as ourselves if we are not coming to the table to talk about how we can uh, protect people better from these senseless acts of gun violence. Is Bookie with us? Janet? It doesn't not... look like it, Gary. Okay. Well, I'll give you a, a, a brief little uh, statement that Bookie was going to talk about. That's Deacon uh, Nancy Bookstein. Um, she was uh, involved at a parish where she was serving not too long ago. 
on this very subject about um, bringing guns to church. And it's a very emotional topic, as you well know. If you haven't experienced it, you've seen it on TV or read it in the papers. And unfortunately, um, this situation, when um, the congregation uh, was talking about guns in church, um, caused a division, and some people had left because they uh, did not feel that guns should be brought into church, if I remember that correctly. And um, as a result of that, I'll uh, pass this on to Roger. Roger is part of St. Luke's in Fort Collins, and they had a very um, respectful dialogue on gun violence in the uh, parish, where it prevented, or I think helped both sides of the spectrum of this conversation uh, listen respectfully and not insult each other and gave each other the ability to uh, voice their uh, feelings on this from their heart. Roger? Yeah, Janet, can you put up the uh, the St. Luke's uh, sequence? We've got slides. Um, <clears throat> so this is how it's gone for us. Janet, let's go to the next. Our first meeting occurred oh a few a, a couple of weeks after Bishop Kim's message, uh, and that message was actually the reason uh, for us uh, coming together. We had maybe fifteen people, but I want to say uh, you can work with three or four people. It doesn't take a a group of that number. We did a brainstorming session, just accepting all ideas. <clears throat> And then in follow-up meetings, we tried to sift them down, but we had no idea what we were doing. We didn't have contacts, uh, and uh, the number of people attending diminished. I recommend that if you're interested, get at least a couple people who will sort of like tag team and keep the energy going. Um, can we have the next slide, Janet? I'm at St. Luke's, St. Luke's Parish in Fort Collins. That's... Uh, our rector is uh, Mother Krista Dias, who was in Colorado Springs at uh, Chapel of Our Savior, and she took hold of our of us and said, "Let's have a listening circle." Uh, th this is for people in the parish. We're inviting gun owners and gun non-owners. She was the facilitator. The bound the uh, ground rules uh, for that. The question was, what is your relationship with guns? Just that simply. She had us sit in a circle. We passed a talking stick. We had maybe 22 people, uh, which meant that we had three minutes each in that uh, meeting. Uh, there was no crosstalk. We listened to each person. We heard stories involving suicides or people in the military. There were a lot of just listening is a seriously opening up thing. And we all felt kind of unified and, and uh, uh, it was a good session. Janet, the next slide. We started sorting through ideas and I'm recommend, if you follow this uh, uh, program, that your next step is to reach out to other parishes uh, in your town. Um, in Fort Collins, there's an interfaith council, and we create we um, created a program at St. Luke's, in which we invited a national a Colorado organization. Actually, it's called Colorado Ceasefire, a very well established, initially founded by Tom Mauser, who was in the um, whose son was lost in the Columbine massacre. Um, and they have a speakers bureau and we got in touch with them for uh, a presentation at St. Luke's on gun safety and on extreme risk protection orders, abbreviated ERPO, um, which are part of the Colorado laws that say, if you know someone that is at risk of violence to themselves or to others, you can seek a court order and uh, um, 
take put those guns in safe storage from them. Um, we had a we had maybe twenty four people uh, from multiple parishes. The premise of this. Uh, of the way we're working is this the vast majority of gun owners are honest and decent citizens ranchers farmers hunters they they respect their guns they know how to use them properly and they don't want to see accidental deaths and suicides and kids killed uh and kids acting out uh we, at st luke's we have, we were working with laney sheffel um, she gave us two speakers, Lydia Walagorski, Joanna Rose. Uh, it was a very successful program. They were giving out free gun locks. Um, and that's as much as we've done. Let's go on to the next one, uh, Janet. We are currently working with um, uh, Lainey Sheffel of uh, Colorado ceasefire for what we're calling, hoping will be called a safe city forum. Uh, we've got a steering group of four people and are working towards the following uh, vision. Um, a large space, maybe arena seating. We've got one of our churches like that or um, somewhere else in the city. We want to wait to select the space. Th with arena seating or people up on, or an elevated stage and six professionals up on stage, a uh, representative of the court, uh, like the DA of the police, of county behavioral health, high school principals, minority population we want to get, particularly the Latino community in Fort Collins, and then a gun dealer, all on stage, speaking from the point of view of their profession, uh, and uh, a ceasefire Colorado um, uh, we'll have a moderator from Ceasefire Colorado, besides the people on stage making little presentations from, on their contribution to the issue, we want to have um, select, selected invitees who have confirmed they'll come with a larger set of um, <clears throat> interests. Uh, I'm thinking student government in high school and in college, school counselors, again, in high school and college, parents, the PTA, the senior center. A lot of some, some people in, 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 in an Alzheimer's position may have to have um, ceasefire order or um, extreme risk protection orders. The sheriff's office post incarceration services for kids that are coming out of there, this follow-up, youth mentoring and diversion programs. Uh, and I think we need an academic from CSU to speak from that point of view. Um, let's do the fifth one, Janet. Um, the, our vision at this point is that the next step will be a diversion program bringing a, with the collaboration of the people we've had on stage or their departments or what uh, uh, some but at CSU can help us organize. Uh, I'm thinking of an example uh, uh, that I, I recently heard a, a talk from a woman named Barbara Kingston, uh, Dr. Barbara Kingston at uh, uh, Colorado Boulder, um, who is part of the Center for the Study uh, and Prevention of Violence. She's, she describes a safe communities, safe school program um, looking at uh, mass shootings are just the tip of the iceberg. Bullying and youth violence is a problem. The deep depths of the iceberg are structural racism and poverty. She want, her aim is to identify the best practices for the development, optimal development of kids and communities, pro-social relationships uh, and uh, involvement and so on. We also had Jonathan McMillan who is uh, director of the Denver Department of Youth Violence Prevention. He's got his program in Denver and uh, probably Bishop Kim uh, knows him. This is where the rubber meets the road. And uh, the next step in the process, if you're going to expand further would be legislative advocacy. And I'd like to uh, uh, invite uh, Melanie Soki up. Melanie's been doing this since um, Sandy Hook. And she's a 
powerful voice. Melanie, are you there? Can you come on? I am. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I um, stepped across the threshold of being an activist with the Sandy Hook shooting, although it had been on my mind for quite a while before that, because I'm I'm on the uh, downside of the 70s now, actually, and um, had watched this problem of gun violence grow throughout my life. One of the things that was a big concern to me was the Aurora theater shooting. Um, my son and daughter-in-law had moved out here to teach at CU. They had friends in Aurora and they used to sometimes go meet up with them and go to that movie theater. And my daughter-in-law texted me the day after the shooting that they were okay. They hadn't gone to that movie theater that night. And at that time I hadn't even know what had happened. So um, it began to grow with me that this was something that was terribly, terribly wrong in our society. And that um, perhaps it was my turn to step up and try to do something about it. Um, this is a very complex issue for a, a, you know, a brief workshop like this, but <clears throat> I'm honored to speak today in memory of Diane Feinstein. May her memory be a blessing. Um, whose political career was forged by the Harvey Milk and, and uh, assassination. Um, also, uh, the the mayor Moscone, I think, was his name. Um, she was there. She could have been killed too. And who um, passed, wrote, and passed the first national bill on um, assault weapon control. Um, you know, this is this is something that. Um, I think connects up with my whole life as a Christian. Um, I had been a so-called cradle Episcopalian and had been in the church most of the time in my life. And I think all of the messages um, that I had been receiving for those many, many years and the examples that I saw before me um, began to coalesce and say to me, hey, you know, you have had a good life by all historical standards. And um, if it's taking a risk to step forward and be an activist, so be it. So I became actually one of the founding members of Moms Demand Action in Indiana. Um, I was one of the people that were trying to figure out how to fly that plane while we were building it. And um, it has changed my life, I will say. Um, you know, in many, many ways, um, the scales fell from my eyes. A lot of illusions that I had about a lot of things were um, corrected. And um, but one of the biggest things that I I have experienced and I carry with me and will always carry with me is the burden of grief from the survivors. There are so many of them. They are everywhere. Um, they are all around you. And if you begin to ask around, you can, and you'll discover that there are many, many people that you know, even who have been affected by gun violence. This is not somebody else's problem. It is not a case of, it could happen to you. It's going to be a question of when, you know, the Boulder shooting, um, having moved here from Indiana to Boulder, um, and in the Boulder area, anyway, I thought I was going to be in an area that was a little less prone to gun violence because where I lived in Indianapolis, there was a lot of urban gun violence. And then, of course, I got caught up um, by knowing that there was somebody that went to my church who had just been in that uh, grocery store, you know, where that mass shooting occurred. Um, you know, we I have to seriously address this as a faith community. If this is what we believe, if we believe as Christians that life is sacred, if we believe we have an obligation to our fellow human beings to not to not stand idly by with, while their blood is being shed, then we need to step forward, I believe, and do something about it. Um, I'm here to represent a couple of, well, you know, I, I have been active in Moms Demand Action. I've taken a step back from that, but I am still active in Colorado Faith Communities United, and they have asked me to do a little mini presentation about what they do here in Colorado and how your parish could become involved with them. Um, I don't know if you have slides on that, Janet, do you? 
Maybe not. No, I do not. Oh, okay. Well, I printed off the slides <laughs> so I can hold them up for you. Um, this is uh, this was the first one. You know how to develop a relationship with Colorado Faith Communities United. This is uh, their recommendation. Develop a re rapid response network within your congregation. If you have people that are interested in, in becoming part of this organization, this is um, one of the things that we do in response to legislation being promoted. We have people that connect up and we will make a representation at the state house. Um, I'll run through this kind of fast. Their um, advocacy team works with people at the state house and will be active, start becoming active in November, you know, before the legislature gets back into session. And anybody that's interested, I can send you copies of these slides. Um, this is a rapid response. This is what a rapid response network response would be like you would receive a message, then you would find out what the bill being proposed is about. Um, so this would be a good time of the year to develop a group of people in your congregation that would be interested in being part of this rapid response network. Um, I can, I have some other stuff that I can send you if you're interested. Um, I had also been asked to tell you that you know, one of the um, the things that they do is they also provide speakers if you need somebody to come and talk to your congregation. And one of the very important things that they've been involved with um, has been the development of the extreme risk protection law, the ERPA law, which um, has been, I think the original one was put into effect about four years ago. Then the updated one went into effect this year. And uh, in case you don't know what that is, it's called the Extreme Risk Protection Law. It, it has been used slowly and steadily, mostly by the Denver Police Department and the Boulder Police Department, who have been quite successful in getting these extreme risk protection orders in place. Um, they, um, they are the greatest users of it. Law enforcement has the best chance of getting one of these established um, better than just an individual trying to do it on your own. If you have a if you have a loved one that's expressing suicidal ideation, it's a, and and there are firearms in their possession, you know, go to a police department and ask them to intervene to get a court order to get those weapons taken away for a certain period of time. Statistics show that a, a person who has access to firearms. Um, you know, who commits suicide, of course, with the firearm it is very unlikely to survive it. But if you can intervene and get the firearm away from the person before they do something that can be healed in some way, then they have, you know, you've averted, you know, a crisis and a tragedy. Um, about four of these, uh, uh, about four uh, to eight of these are put into play every month, and uh, there's a steady, constant, growing use of them. Um, let's see, what else do I want to say? This is uh, the very end of uh, pre Suicide Prevention Month. So, you know, for all other intents and purposes, whatever you may think about gun ownership or your opinions about the Second Amendment and that kind of thing, I think we can all gather behind the idea of preventing people from killing themselves or killing others. So this is a very um, useful thing to keep in mind that the gun violence prevention mo movement has accomplished. Um, so anyway, I understand we're gonna go into breakout sessions and if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them then or afterward. Thanks. Janet, is is uh, do we have uh, Nancy Bookstein? Uh, can she show her face? She's going to be one of the moderators. I'm here. Yeah. She's here. I'm here. Um, and okay. I'm perfectly. Um, I'm Nancy Bookstein. I'm the deacon 
at St. Bridget Episcopal Church in Frederick. And it's perfect to follow you, um, Melanie, because I was faculty at the med school um, when the Aurora shooting occurred. And um, I didn't know that young man, but I certainly met him a lot at the coffee shop. Mm -hmm. So um, that's not what spurred me to this. Um, what I want to do for a couple of minutes is just open up the elephant in the room, which to me is our parishes being equally divided. And I'll tell you a story. Um, I have a wonderful parish and they're wonderful people. And when the call went out, secular call went out after one of the school shootings, to um, take away everybody's gun, or that's what they thought. Um, we did not make a move. The people in charge did not make a move. They chose not to. And because of that, we lost some people um, because they didn't want guns in the church. On the other side of the coin, um, we also had people who came who did want guns in the church. And so I just want to open up as we're talking about parishes and getting them um, excited to join this struggle um, that we need to find a way to better manage, better explain the whole concept of what gun violence was, is. Um, I talked about it a few days ago with someone and said, I'm not going to let him take my guns away. And, and I said, this has nothing to do with your guns. It's not your guns. And I think people beyond us, beyond the people maybe even that um, are attending today, they don't know the difference between what we want to do instead of in terms of preventing gun violence and their Second Amendment rights. My vote would be to give them all bayonets and say fine. <laughs> Okay. Um, if I could, Roger, yeah, I just yeah. want to jump in and um, say to you all, uh, I put it in the chat, but thank you for your presence here. And this is hard work, but it is holy work. Um, I think we, I, I spoke at uh, my baccalaureate in my alma mater, and I said to the, the graduating seniors there, you know, not only are you the the generation who's had to do active shooter drills in school, you're also the generation who endured COVID. You you have all of these things. And when I look at things like the suicide rate in this state, um, I I I know that that we this is a deep spiritual problem that we have. And I am grateful for you and your willingness to do this work. Grateful for your willingness to listen and to hear people and to stand firm in that uh, promotion of peace and respecting the dignity of every human being, which is um, part of our baptismal covenant promises. And so I want you to know how much I appreciate you, how much I thank you for, for, for beginning these hard conversations. And yes, they are hard, but I think, you know, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, we have the opportunity to to listen to one another and to listen in a way that makes a difference in our world. Mm -hmm. So I have to jump off for another uh, event, but I just want to, to take this time to say thank you. Thank you. Um, Janet, do we have a sense of the group? Would we like to break down into groups of uh, three or maybe four each, one moderator with however many, we've got four moderators now, break into smaller groups or do we want to maintain this uh, current, uh, what's 12, 14, and start a discussion? We have 23 participants. You can't see them all on one screen. Mm -hmm. um, I have created uh, four breakout rooms. So there'll be four, five to six people per room and a host should be in each one. Okay. Um, of those rooms. So Roger, before we break out, do yes. you want to talk about what the goal of the breakout rooms would be? Well, it's to, 
it, in my room, I will uh, share the agenda uh, first to ask you to take a moment and remember the things that stood out to you from the conversation so far, and then we'll jot those down, set them aside, and then let's meet each other. Secondly, let's eat, hear from each person what what parish they're in, how they're why they're here, what parish they're in, and uh, what the attitude is in their town about guns. Um, then move on to uh, the the ideas that they that the their response to what's been presented so far and how they think you how you think you might want to carry your commitment on to the next step. And then for the last like 10 or 15 minutes, let's uh, come back to the common group and share the ideas that have been sifted out. Does that sound good, Janet? Okay. Janet. So if you're just starting out, would you pursue CFCU and then perhaps add C uh, cease fires or what is that the name of it um well, well actually i'm going to uh, recommend um it uh, later this month uh at saint luke's i uh, uh, probably from the uh, from the readers podium um we want to get a set of people we're already well underway in our um safe city collaboration or safe city uh, forum and uh, the best way that people can help us is to uh, join the monthly meeting of the Interfaith Council and stand by and we'll draw on you as uh, you can put us into contact with police officers, you know, and so on. But I'm asking people there to sign up for the Rapid Response Network. I'm asking for two volunteers, hopefully beside myself and my uh, colleague, uh, Patrick Gill, uh, we're kind of tag teaming. We had, my wife, Catherine, who is here, we had to go on a vacation uh, and Patrick was there to follow up. Patrick's currently in Texas with his uh, new grandson and I'm following up. Nice to have two people to work with and tag team. Uh, joining the uh, Rapid Response Network is an easy operation. Uh, and if you want to follow in our path, uh, the next step after you... Uh, um, it's sort of have your people that want to start. The next step would be uh, communicating with other parishes and inviting them. Well, no, the next step would be a listening circle. Get all the people you can in the parish together. And listen, just talk about how they feel about guns. Do they own guns? Are they careful? Uh, do they know? Okay. Listen with your heart. That's the first step. And if you begin there, we're beginning in unity, not in confrontation. Uh, then if that goes well, the next step would be to, for my part, contact uh, Colorado Ceasefire. And I'll give you, I'll be at the, Catherine and I will be at the exhibits at, in Grand Junction, and we'll give you email addresses and copies of flyers we've used. And we're here to help uh, a parish that is kind of getting going off the ground. Um, and so if you follow our path after the Rapid Response Network, start inviting and start come in and then get a speaker in to talk about gun safety and the extreme risk protection orders. That's not gonna alienate honest and decent gun owners. Roger, we are back in our larger group and thank you for those last words that you just spoke probably specifically to the group that you were in. Yeah. I think it, you are correct that if we listen with our heart, we will all come together and um, I think break down some of these walls and barriers regarding this uh, very emotional topic and we'll all come together as a community and stay strong and um, this is definitely a marathon, this uh, issue. This is not a sprint. This is not something that can be solved overnight, as Melanie alluded to earlier in her personal involvement. So um, 
as we uh, continue this conversation, um, as time goes on, I think it will become contagious as uh, as individual members of the Episcopal Church in Colorado and as parishes come together with a stronger, louder voice, we will have an impact. What, Gary, do any, were there any ideas that seemed salient from your group? Yeah, we, we talked about supporting that 2012 resolution of making parishes gun safe zones and then definitely uh, looking then definitely looking for, for direction from the bishop's office on taking the lead on this and encourage uh, parishes to have um, discussions on gun violence. And maybe even at next year's clergy conference have Bishop Kim talk about this. Okay, um, Nancy. We didn't get that far, <laughs> but we we did come to a general um, general conclusion. And where are you, Catherine Kit? I'm here. Go ahead. Well, I was the note taker, um, huh. and <laughs> um, I get we spent a little bit of time on what the role of the Episcopal Church in Colorado should be in terms of uh, trying to affect uh, the use of guns or the carrying of guns in church and in public and so forth. And I don't know that we came to a consensus. Um, I think it's just like the rest of the population. I think there's a, a variety of experiences. One of the members of our breakout group talked about having a long list of people that she was close to who died by guns and whether it was suicide or whatever. Um, I, I also was struck by the fact that in this group today, all of us are kind of grandparents. <laughs> and I think that we it, in Fort Collins would be well served by bringing in high school students and college students, university students, yeah. because they have a lot of energy and they are the ones who are gonna be inheriting this world. Okay. Um, Melanie, what ideas sifted out in your uh, group? Uh, I, I don't know that we, we came up with an idea as such. Um, but what we did discover was a real diversity of attitudes in the different uh, among the participants, which um, one one uh, shared with us that their senior warden concealed carry and would and conducted actually a, a a lockdown drill with them, and um, you know she said she thought that even if they even talked about it um, that it would divide their church. She's concerned about you know even bringing up the topic and um excuse me melanie where was that church do you know yes yeah, saint, that luke's. saint luke's in delta that's elizabeth i mean elizabeth i hope i've you know communicated saint luke's in delta where is that i don't know on the western slope the close western to grand slope. junction okay uh, you're gonna you be know. at the conference at the uh, yes. Convention. Elizabeth, uh, look forward to seeing you. So this is Western Slope, Melanie. Please continue. Yes. Right. And um, and Barbara, who goes to St. John's in Denver, um, is voiced her, you know, her, uh, I don't know, her comment was that she doesn't understand why people are so afraid. What are people so afraid of that they even need to carry guns in church? Um and she was talking about, you know, people needing to educate their children, I, as, as I perceive what she said about better conflict revel resolution, for one thing, um, you know, that was and But we had this and we discovered that two of our members had had gun tragedies in their lives. And um, so, I mean, as a point that I was making earlier is that, you know, it it does touch everyone. You think it's not going to touch you, but it does because of the just the the a vast number of guns that we have out there. Um, so I mean, it's 
it's um it's humbling actually to see um what we're up against here and in coming up with any kind of a unifying idea <laughs> out of the whole diocese because we're all over the place you know we have people who would be in favor of uh, having a gun free zone i know in in boulder um in fact st john's in boulder i know because i've i've been told they have the the signage on their church you know that it's a gun free zone um, I brought it up with my particular uh, at my parish with my rector, and she said she was uneasy about it. She said I have to have the vestry vote on it. So it's it's a really complicated issue, and I don't have any I don't have any really good perspective here. Except one person said the least we could do would be to pray and start getting some sort of a group together, and the you know perhaps in your parish to pray together about it see where the Holy Spirit might be leading. I think that was Vicky's idea. You know, where would the Holy Spirit be leading us to address this issue? That's, I'll write up my notes and send them on. Thank you, Melanie. Um, everyone you, is welcome to send their notes to me and uh, I'll put them together as best I can. And, and I think we have an email list, probably Janet, from this group? Will this group, can I email out to this group? Uh, we can discuss that after we get off. Okay, um, we can talk about that. Take all the notes that you've provided in your presentations. And if um, Melanie would send me hers, we can include that with the recording on the web page so that people will have access to those notes. Okay. Um, this recording will be posted within the next 24 to 48 hours. Uh, if depending on what editing needs to happen, if any. Um, and I will stop the recording. <laughs>